Okay, again, so yeah, again, good morning, everybody. And again, uh, thank you again to, to Kim and Sun for the kind invitation. And and really, this is kind of like a, a joint presentation uh, from Dr. Drake and myself. I know he, he unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. Um, so I'm going to try to present a, kind of like a, a subset of the work that we did. I know earlier in the term, I think, you know, Dr. Drake was able to present a kind of like a broader overview of a variety of activities, uh, some of the faculty members that we work with. But I think for the topic today was I want to kind of pick something a little bit more specific, a little bit more kind of near and dear to my heart in terms of, you know, developing million based of tools. Um, and these can be both robotic tools and manual tools for both uh, neurosurgery and for ENT. And ENT here stands for ear, nose, and throat. Or there's also a long form, which is otolaryngology in this case. So what I thought I wanted to do this morning first was to, to kind of give you guys, oops, yep. Kind of start with kind of neuroanatomy 101. This is kind of, I'm going to spend kind of like four or five slides kind of giving you basically a crash course in terms of the, the context and kind of the motivation and the framework that we're trying to work with um, in building these tools to kind of work in this type of environment. So the first one here, you know, the picture on the left is the, is the brain. And then you know, one of the things you're going to notice, I've highlighted a lot of these uh, arteries and vessels. So one of the challenges inside of working inside neurosurgery is the brain itself is very highly vascularized in this case. There's a lot of lo both large vessels and small vessels that are permeating through uh, the brain mass. And this can cause challenges in terms of both um, if you're resecting tissue or you're trying to um, cut or divide different areas, you might end up causing quite severe bleeding. And then one of the concepts of is called hemostasis. And so hemostasis is controlling the blood flow. So hemostasis inside neurosurgery is one of the, the key factors in terms of maintaining good visibility. And we're, what you're gonna notice is often in a lot of cases when you're operating inside, you will see that you're operating in a fluid environment. And so the picture on the right-hand side there is the ventricles, uh, both the, the lateral ventricles leading to the third ventricle. And these are essentially cavities that are inside the brain containing fluid filled vessels. And these fluids are basically circulating and generated inside the brain. And they will also then flow down into the spinal column in this case. So in a lot of our procedures that we talk about for minimal invasive neurosurgery is we try to operate inside these ventricles to work and reach into different targets. These could be tumors. Uh, these could be malfunctioning areas that are for epilepsy. And these could be different um, uh, defects or mouth uh, deformities that we're trying to reach. And when you're in operating inside these ventricles, you are pretty much operating underwater in this case. So this kind of relates back to my original point on the left there is that if you're cutting and let's say if you actually cut a vessel, your entire field of view, you imagine, is going to be covered in blood in this case, because essentially the blood will fill up that environment and you need an ability to kind of uh, both clear the, the blockage of the, of the blood and, but then also a way to kind of stop the bleeding at the same time. So one of the procedures that we're interested in, um, so uh, I guess a bit of a, a forewarning is that I have a couple of slides related to some anatomy. So there might be a bit of a um, blood in that case for early in the morning in this case. Um, so when people think about neurosurgery, they think of neurosurgery as often as a very open procedure. Um, because one of the things of accessing the brain is, you know, it's obviously surrounded by the skull and you have to basically make uh, what they call a procedure called a craniotomy in order to cut through the bone of the skull and expose the brain. So the figure that I show on the left-hand side there is a procedure from an epilepsy surgery called a hemispherotomy. So for those who don't know, epilepsy is a condition which you have basically misfiring neurons inside the brain uh, causing seizures. So often these can be isolated to certain pockets or certain regions of the brain. And in a lot of cases, the epilepsy seizures can be treated with medication. So this helps the patient be able to kind of control their seizure activity and resume a normal course of life. But there's a significant amount of the epilepsy population which is actually medically refractory. So this means their seizures cannot be controlled by medication and they actually have to, they're, they're unable to respond to this. So one of the procedures that they look at, and this is the one, one of the uh, procedures that we're interested in, is how do we isolate different areas of the brain? So uh, the figure I show there is what they call a hemispherotomy. This is what you're kind of disconnecting portions, either of part of the hemisphere or the entire part of the hemisphere from the other half. And what you're effectively doing then is isolating the seizure zones from propagating. So you imagine the seizures start localized in one part of the brain and due to, due to the white matters, which is basically interconnectivity between regions of the brain, the seizure activity can spread. So what we wanted to try to do here is effectively kind of um, isolate those areas. 
So then the figure there on the left, or sorry, on the right hand side is a craniotomy, which now we've, you know, the surgeons here have um, dissected uh, a section of the bone away, they expose uh, the dura of the brain, and then this is lifted apart. And then you can see, you know, figure E there is uh, where it's still highly vascularized, a lot of blood, and now it's been cleared off. And now you have uh, just the thin dura, which is a little membrane on top of the brain uh, that covers it before you access it. So in addition to the tissue itself, there's often you know, neurovascular conditions. So neurovascular conditions um, can be malformations. These could be blockages like stroke um, uh, or uh, ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke that can occur. And this was a figure that was provided by one of our interventional radiologists. Um, this is known as a cavernous malformation. So these are vessels that are kind of, have created basically, uh, basically like, almost like a bird's nest or like a spider web of vessels that are created inside. So these can often can be quite high risk in terms of these could be lead to rupture or blockages. And the figure on the left-hand side is there is basically one, an MR image that we've taken and we've kind of created a 3D model um, of a figure that we're gonna to provide to the interventional radiologist to help them do planning and to do treatment. So this also gives you another idea in terms of, you know, in addition to defects and the tumors, these can be vascular malformations that we're trying to either treat or to isolate or to clip away. And in a lot of these cases, um, these neurovascular malformations can be treated through catheter-based procedures. So this is one of the ideas of minimally invasive approaches. Instead of taking a large incision in terms of your head and accessing, you can potentially uh, snake catheters through vessels and entering up into the brain to treat these malformations, whether it's to coil it, whether it's to stent it. But you're gonna see later on, you know, for anybody who's ever seen a, a catheter, um, a catheter is essentially a long plastic tube that's very flexible. And that's one of the challenges is that, you know, this flexibility allows it to kind of flex and to follow the pathway, but often provides challenges in terms of how do you then target and, you know, provide targeted treatment in those areas. <clears throat> So, so let's know, so what the next thing I wanted to do was I said, well, let's pick an area that now we want to try and look at a bit more is in terms of, you know, how do we approach or how do we, you know, take the concept of minimally invasive and convert these large invasive procedures into something that's minimally invasive. So in neurosurgery, there's a subset called neuroendoscopy. So neuroendoscopy here is equivalent to laparoscopy or minimally invasive surgery that's done for general surgery or for thoracic surgery. Um, and it's in the same concept that it's called keyhole surgery. So you see the figure on the left-hand side there is, you know, what they've done is, is we've drilled a hole that's approximately eight millimeters to 10 millimeters in diameter. And from there, you're able to insert a rigid scope or what they call a trocar. And the trocar then can be pushed into the brain and used to access, uh, in this case, for the ventricles. And then as you push this solid trocar or this rod into the ventricle there, uh, now you have the ability to insert different tools and different viewing um, tools that are inside. So you can place a camera, you can play an instrument, you also have irrigation. And the figure on the right-hand side there it kind of shows a sagittal cross-section that allows you to kind of get inside the ventricle there. And now you notice, you know, we've gone through the skin incision, we've gone through the burr hole, through the upper cortex, through the corpus callosum, and into the ventricle there. And for now, you, got, you have access now to different areas. Um, so well, the one thing you're going to notice is that, you know, surrounding the ventricles itself is in addition to, you know, the normal white, uh, gray matter is, you know, there could potentially be a tumor there, but there also is, could be very uh, critical structures that are very close by. You have something like the pateria, pateria gland, you have the uh, optic chasm um, and other, you know, nervous areas that could be very sensitive. So one of the challenges when you're operating this space is that not in addition to it being small, is that it's also surrounded by critical vessels that are, you know, critical vessels that could bleed, but also critical functional tissue that you have to be very precise in. So I think that leads us to part of the challenge is that you have issues that are related to small size of the tools, but also safety of the tools as the surgeons are operating in this case. Um, so this is just a kind of a couple of bullet points I want to highlight from the figure there is that, you know, we often think of neurosurgery as an open procedure requiring this craniotomy, it takes slows the brain. Um, obviously, with any invasive procedure, this often requires a long patient recovery time uh, and, you know, and added complications required to open surgery. And one of the things that we're interested in doing is, you know, looking at neuroendoscopy, which is known as keyhole surgery. These tools are inserted through burr holes to access the brain. And, you know, this type of neuroendoscopy is equivalent to laparoscopy in the sense that it has straight rigid tools. But one of the key differences 
in comparison to you know laparoscopy to neuroendoscopy is that you don't have the ability to pivot in this case. So if you imagine with normal general surgery, which you insert tools in an inflated belly, which has a big balloon, you're able to kind of put the tool in and you're able to kind of pivot around that port. Um, in this case, as you see, if you insert a tool inside the brain to access certain area, that tool is often surrounded by the white matter and all the other tissue around it. So you cannot necessarily push a lot or leverage the tool around without creating a lot of compression or a lot of force on the brain, which you don't necessarily want in that case. So that is often an added challenge is that it, it has the same concept of laparoscopy, but you don't have that same ability and range of motion um, in terms of standard middle invasive surgery. Um, so this is one, uh, a good way to you know, talk about some of the limitations. So on the picture on the left-hand side, this is a, an annual neuroendoscopy course that we run for our fellows and, and residents. And there, Dr. Sudan from Cornell, one of our colleagues is teaching, you know, how to, the residents, how to remove uh, a colloid cyst. So there on the bottom right-hand side is an MR image. And the white flare that you see in the middle is the colloid cyst that's located centrally inside the brain. So what the residents and fellows are trying to do is they're trying to put tools, you know, these straight rigid tools uh, through the trocar and into the ventricle there to white to reach this white flare in the middle and then be able to do two things. One, to hopefully evacuate or uh, essentially irrigate away that cyst, but then also pull it away from the central part of the brain. But you're going to notice one of the challenges is you're going to see right away is that, you know, as they're operating there, you know, one of the things you see is they have both their hands together. And that's why I want to try to show the figure on the right hand side there is that even though these uh, tool channels have the ability to insert, you know, not just one, but potentially two tools, as well as a camera, you have this issue, what we call kind of sword fighting. In the sense that, you know, we have these handles at the very top and they're really sandwiched really closely together. So you don't really have much ability to do much, you know, motion of the hands or what the handles colliding and even your hands clashing with themselves, but also with external equipment. And one of the things that you'll also see is that uh, when you're operating, the tools are quite uh, straight in the sense that, you know, they have two degrees of freedom. Um, is that, okay, yeah, so the video is running. So, um, I'll narrate a bit as the video is running. So this is a simulated pineal tumor removal. So this is a, a 3D printed silicone brain that we've had made for our trainees. Uh, what we have there in the middle is basically a simulated pineal tumor. So in this case, we've become very fancy and we've used it in a strawberry in this case to assimilate the fibrous tissue. We've actually created a little membrane around the strawberry and then attached it to the, to the target anatomy. And so you, and what you're seeing here is actually me being a very poor neurosurgeon, you know, having two tools here, you know, my left hand has scissors, which we're trying to cut away this, you know, rigid membrane on the right hand side there. And then on the right hand, what I have is I have a, a suction tube. So I'm trying to use a suction tube to try to irrigate and to also suck away the tumor mass. Uh, so you can see, I'm not having much success here. You know, you know, the field of view is quite restricted. The tools there, you see me, I'm kind of moving forward and back. I don't have too much lateral motion in terms of moving left and right. Um, and that's part of the challenge using these rigid tools. And then I'll fast forward the video a little bit. So here in this case, um, I've switched tools and here I actually have a grasper. And what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to reach in and I'm trying to basically pull sections of this tumor um, into small enough pieces that my tube on the right-hand side can then irrigate. So you can see that's where I'm kind of coming in, I'm pulling, you can see I'm going to let go and I'm going to try to rotate this into the suction tube. The video is a bit, yeah, video is a bit choppy, unfortunately. Uh, but you see, I've rotated it and now I'm trying to use my irrigation and suction and remove the tumor in this case. And, you know, this was done for about 15, 20 minutes. And I can tell you, this was probably only removing maybe 20% or 25% of the tumor. There's actually a much larger mass that's still deeper inside that cavity there in this case. Um, so this is actually a model that we actually use to help evaluate both our manual and rigid tools. Uh, but this, I think, is a, a really good example of showing some of the limitations and challenges in terms of, you know, the current set of rigid tools and the current view that we have. Um, the next part, you know, related to the, the ENT part is that, uh, is, you know, we're often quite interested in trans sinus procedures. So on the left hand side there is a shallow view, again, of the nasal cavity, um, and then, you know, uh, both the upper airway, the nasal pharynx, oral pharynx, the hydropharynx. And we're trying to insert tools, basically it could be through the oral cavity or through the sinus area. And in this case, we might be then working through our way through the sphenoid sinus, through the ventral sinus to access these small cavities 
that might have you know, cancerous conditions or defects. And what I want to show you there is on the next page is one, a sample that's provided by one of our clinicians is a case of a disease called Ewing sarcoma. So the Ewing sarcoma is a, essentially a cancerous mass and the little asterisk that's uh, shown there on the right-hand side is the target area. And that kind of that uh, gray material there is the tissue or the tumor that they're trying to remove in this case. But you can imagine the only way that you're able to access is kind of up from, up from the top of the sinus. And then you have to essentially have to make a sharp uh, right turn you know, into the sinus cavity. Um, so uh, Dr. Um, uh, Walter, who showed us one of this procedure, you know, he showed us a tool on the right-hand side there is this, you know, there's a right angle tool that they kind of have to try to insert and try to get into that mass there. But even, you know, with a right angle tool, you can imagine there's still a long corridor that you have to traverse kind of straight down before kind of turning sharp right. And even to access that part, there's a significant amount of bone that has to be removed in order for just, in this case, not even for the removal, but just even for a simple biopsy in this case. So you imagine this tumor is kind of encased uh, by the, the, the skull material around it and access this. So this is one of, another one of our motivations is that, you know, can we have tools that can be inserted and they can be steerable, but at the same time being steerable, they also have to be sufficiently strong and have enough stiffness to actually interact and work with the tissue at the same time. And then kind of the last area that we kind of want to build on was essentially the middle ear in this case. So here again, we face a similar type of challenge, which is a long narrow corridor that you're working through the middle ear and you're trying to either kind of go through the tympanic membrane and into the tympanic cavity. And there, again, there could be uh, tumorous vessels or sort of tumorous tissue. There could be vessels or defects that you kind of uh, to either resect or to remove. And then similar to the, the tissue inside the brain, you have uh, various types of nerves, the cochlea, the optic nerves, the, the facial nerves. And in this case, you have these very small windows of that you're going to operate. And then if you, if you effectively go outside of the windows, you might go to, might accidentally paralyze the person's facial tissue or their muscle response in this case. So, so hopefully that kind of gives you a bit of an appreciation in terms of like both the context of the, the size and the volume of that we're trying to deal with. So what I want to do now was I want to kind of give you a comparison was, you know, in laparoscopy, which has been now for, has been around for a very long time. And I would say for a lot of procedures, for let's say gallbladder removal, uh, prostate removal, this has become almost like a, a gold standard in the sense that a lot of these cases are well-defined in the sense that laparoscopy on the left is essentially you're filling the belly you know, with CO2. So this gets insufflated and you have a, a nice large operating volume. You can insert now your same rigid scopes either for a single area or for multiple ports and you have a large volume of operating. Uh, but unfortunately, this is one of the challenges is, is that the tools here are still rigid. These are essentially long rigid tools. And one of the early challenges, and it's still a challenge today, is there has to be dedicated training and teaching in terms of, you know, converting surgeons from, you know, just using their hands normally, which have a lot of degrees of freedom, into you know, trying to accomplish the same procedure with less degrees of freedom. And I think this is where, you know, surgical robotics has made a significant impact. And the picture I showed there is the Da Vinci XI robotic system. And I think one of the things that really has made a big challenge or a big change and gotten a lot of positive feedback is this concept of the figure on the right, top, upper right hand side is this wrist. And one of the beautiful things about the Da Vinci system is they've been able to kind of recreate this wrist motion. You have this ability, much like the human wrist to kind of you know, turn left and right, up and down and to rotate. And they've been able to capture that ability and put it in the tip of a surgical tool. So now on the figure on the bottom right hand side, this is what we call like a, a laparoscopic trainer, which is essentially you know, a plastic shell, which is used for um, teaching the surgeons how to do laparoscopy is you have the Da Vinci XI inserted into these ports. And now you see the wonderful thing about this is that you don't have to give up your ability to do fine manipulations of the skip. You have that same ability to kind of pitch and to rotate and to turn um, all located at the, uh, at the tip of the tool while only operating through small incisions. Um, but as you know, one of the challenges is that when you're operating on a very small area, um, these tools can be very small or very challenging to build. And I want to kind of just highlight a different type of robotics here called continuum robotics, uh, which I know, you know, uh, Professor Bergner um, at UTM is, you know, one of the experts in this area. And for us, we, you know, we really are intrigued and fascinated about this type of technology in terms of, you know, these different types of structures allow for continuous shape 
that can be used for curvature of your motion. So these have some form of stiffness and rigidity that allows you to kind of both insert and transverse different types of anatomy. And you can travel, you know, to large vessels or through spaces that can be operating, you know, to the cardiac, to the heart, or they can be transversing through the sinuses to the brain. And, you know, this concept of continuum robotics could potentially provide an interesting solution. You know, these can be made out of a single material. Um, they, can, they can be from a shape memory alloy that could be customized on perioperative imaging, or they can be made out of cells of the formal unit to form a composite manipulator. And that's kind of a picture I showed uh, there on the bottom right-hand side, which is an EU project called Stiflop. And here they've created little cells of flexible material that can be fused together to create a little kind of like octopus tentacle that can be you know, rotated and to be inflated or deflated to create different types of shapes. And then the figure on the right is more of our, you know, using a single material. And this is kind of like the concept, if you look at the cross section in figure B, is you can have a lens, you can have a left arm or a right arm, and these tubes can be extended. And I mentioned the benefits of these tools is they can navigate a lot of these tortuous anatomical pathways to reach the disease. And then I think for us, one of the, the nice things about this is that they're relatively simple to fabricate. You know, if you can imagine these are essentially long tubes that we can shape set. There's not a need for complex, you know, uh, gear or force transmission mechanisms or motors. Um, you, you can imagine if you're trying to build a, a motor or drive uh, solution that's on two to millimeters in diameter, you're going to have fabrication challenges related to this in this case. So I think with that, I want to kind of dive in this a little bit more and talk about, um, you know, two specific areas that we're interested in on continuum robotics. One is, you know, the planning and optimization. <clears throat> And the other is the tool parameter design. So, you know, I highlighted the, you know, the flexibility of these robotic structures of Kindy Robot allows for a lot of customization. And for us working in pediatrics and working for, you know, small patients, uh, being patient specific or target specific is a wonderful benefit. So, you know, operating in children and, you know, children can have a range from, you know, as small as a newborn, uh, or it could be, you know, almost like a full size adult, like a 14, 15 year old, which is, uh, you know, has the same adult size anatomy. So being able to customize these tools to based on the specific shape and anatomy is quite helpful. And this is one of the challenges is that, especially for us, is that a lot of standard tools are often quite large or not, or not shaped for the irregular anatomy that we quite often challenge. So one of the things that when you're trying to do patient specific or target specific tools is you always have a set of design parameters. These can be curvature, uh, these can be length, they can be stiffness. And, you know, the simple abstract figure I've shown there is kind of like one of the questions that we bring up is imagine you have kind of these red dots that are essentially, you know, vessels, or these could be critical anatomy that you're trying to reach. But then you have these small blue dots, which can be the disease tissue or the target tissue that you're trying to reach. So now the question is, ends up being, you know, how can you vary, you know, the curvature, the length, or the stiffness of these uh, materials to be able to kind of navigate around the red dots, but at the same time be able to let you reach the blue dots. So I think this now uh, poses a really interesting, uh, you know, research question and topic that people have investigating, and this is an area that we're quite uh, intrigued. Is it becomes a, a design optimization? So you have an optimization problem based on a set of constraints. So what I wanted to do is I want to kind of just highlight two papers that a couple of my colleagues uh, have worked on in the past. Uh, one is concentric to a robot design optimization by Bergelis, as well as computer assisted planning for concentric to robots uh, by Grana, who is actually one. Um, uh, a former PhD student from Professor Bergner. So here what you have is you have a, these design parameters and these have to be, you're basically set up, you take your design parameters and your restrictions, whether they're anatomical constraints and they're formed a cost function. And this now, this cost function has to be either be minimized or maximized to form a solution set in this case. So here the, the bottom figure there is a, is a figure that I've taken for uh, from Bergelis's paper. And this essentially shows um, the, ventri the ventricle of the brain. And you have essentially the red dots. So the red dots he's here has highlighted as cauterization points. So cauterization points are areas where the robot wants to reach in order to basically um, burn the tissue and to stop potentially fluid or burning or sorry, some bleeding from occurring. And then the blue points are essentially a set of uh, waypoints. And then the very top RA is the entry point inside the brain in this case. And so now you basically, you have a set of cauterization points, you have a set of waypoints, 
And then uh, what he's shown there on the right hand side is a set of the different robot solutions. So this is the different types of configurations the robot can or cannot reach uh, based on these constraints. And you can see on the bottom uh, right hand side, so the bottom two figures are where he shows actually collisions with the anatomy in this case. So this is part of the, I think, interesting design challenge is that how are you able to kind of maximize the volume of what you're trying to reach um, without hitting uh, unwanted uh, tissue or un unwanted vessels in this case. So for us, you know, I want to kind of point to a very, um, a more specific example here that we've done in our lab is there are two specific procedures here. We have something called an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, an ETB, and an endoscopic tumor biopsy, say an ETB in this case. So normally these are two separate procedures, but uh, we pose the question is that, you know, can you potentially use a concentric tube robot or a container robot to potentially combine these procedures and find out what the best burr hole location is? So the burr hole location is what's the best location to insert the tool into the brain so it's actually can hit both of these targets. So in this case here, I've taken, you know, basically a, a, a really re reduced set of steps from an algorithm from one of our former PhD students, Kyle Eastwood. And the idea is that we said, you know, we first set that, we set the number of number of sections, we picked the surgical targets, we picked an initial burr hole location. And then the next step we do is we, we say that, okay, we deploy the tool inside, we calculate the error to the target as well as the error to other different vessels or critical anatomy. We see if that design is a part of an existing space. And then if it is, we, you know, we say, well, that's been tried. And then we move, move on to the next step. And then we then we kind of iterate by moving this burr hole all along different areas of the skull. And we can see if we can find uh, basically minimizing this error of both to the target and anatomy to see what is possible. So, you know, using that very simplistic you know, four-step approach, you know, we look at the, uh, the sample anatomy in this case. So this is uh, the target that we're looking at. So similar to the other example, you know, we have the pink is the, the ventricle that we're trying to go in. And then the two targets that we're going to try to show, so it's going to be a little bit tricky to see, is basically that green mass is the pineal tumor. And then the other uh, target on the back, uh, sorry, on the bottom is the surgical target. So that's where we kind of blown up the figure um, on the, the right-hand side there is that you're trying to reach this green mass called the pineal tumor. And then you're kind of trying to reach down to do this ETV in this case, which is essentially coming down and you're trying to punch a hole to allow the fluid to drain down. So again, normally, if you remember from the first the training video, our, our standard tools are actually straight. So you don't actually have an ability to kind of flex and to bend. So if you were to try to take the pineal tumor sample, you might have to go through one entry. And then there's likely you might not have enough space or enough angulation to actually reach down and the bend to reach the second target. So this would require a second burr hole that you have to drill, a second insertion, a longer procedure. But we've shown now like with a simple, uh, essentially one degree of freedom tool that you can bend, you can insert this tool down through a specific burr hole. And now you're able to kind of bend up take a sample of the pineal tumor, but then also bend down and then take punch the whole fruit to actually drain the fluid. And so all this can now be done for a single incision versus a, a dual incision in this case. Um, so the tools here I've, you know, I've described as, I would say fairly simplistic still in the sense that, you know, we're going down, you know, taking a, a straight sample or punching a hole. We're not doing quite sophisticated manipulation of the tissue in terms of trying to reach up and to cut different areas and trying to manipulate areas. And if you remember from the very first video, that's one of the challenges right now is that, you know, if we're trying to resect this tumor, the, these current tools don't allow you to do very much in terms of motion. So that's where we said, well, why don't we insert a second arm? Why don't we have a second tool to go down and really give the surgeons, you know, a left hand and give them a right hand in this case. And so this is where we decided to do bimanual uh, concentric tube robots. And one of the big motivations I mentioned at the beginning was hemostasis. So this is the whole concept is, you need your left hand and right hand to give you good control of the blood flow and bleeding to avoid um, issues in terms of blocking a field of view and ensuring uh, safety and success. Um, so we said here, well, you know, obviously in this case, one of our arms and manipulator has to be a cautery device. So a cautery device is really just a device that conducts electricity that allows you to basically apply heat and energy to seal a vessel. And then your other hand can be a pair of scissors or a grasper, and then you can basically try to manipulate uh, the tissue itself. But you can imagine when you're operating these uh, robotic tools is one of our students, Saba, you know, was interested in looking at this was that if you imagine when you're operating just like your arm, these often these tools might be able to crisscross and they might be able to collide with each other. And that's one of the things that is not intuitive 
using concentric tube or continual ones is that with a standard serial manipulator, if you think of an industrial watt that has essentially kind of like your shoulder, has your elbow, has your wrist, you, intu you intuitively know where your elbow is located, where your shoulder is located, so you can avoid your arms from colliding with each other in this case. Um, due to the, the kinematics and kind of like the formulation of the position of the continual watts, this may not be as intuitive. So you might be moving the tips where you want, but you may end up colliding. Um, upstream where your arms could be. And that's kind of like the procedure that we showed here. Um, Sab one of our students is that, you know, she's trying to trace this path of uh, this linear cutting path. And now that both the left arm and the right arm have collided with each other. And we're saying, well, if we want to do this cutting for the Daphne's procedure, we have to find a way of how to handle collisions between the arms. So this is one of the targets that we're trying to look at is that, you know, we're trying to cut out this strip at the top of the, the the ventricle, which is called a corpus callosotomy, which is essentially separating one half of the, the seizure areas. And now we have a set of uh, target points we're trying to reach. And then so, so now as the arms are moving, Saba is now actively calculating the basically the separation distance and using that as another um, active constraint to basically avoid the arms from colliding each other as they're moving along. So in this case, you might get some you know, interesting effects. So you know, figure A on the top right side there is show the arms trying to reach these two points, but you know one has collided over another because it's basically reaching over and it has kind of reached too deep. But now, after her self-collision algorithm, the arm is now the algorithm has now determined that okay, the arm in order to reach that has to reach a higher arc to kind of come down before we're reaching that too. And then the same case on figure C and D is that we're trying to reach these two other points along the surface. You have an initial collision, then we turn on the collision avoidance, and now the arms can actually even though it's, it, it's probably a bit counterintuitive when you know, one arm is actually snaking below each other to reach the point while the other arm is reaching over. But all this is done uh, transparent to the operator in the sense that the surgeon or user doesn't have to experience that mental load to figure out, well, well hold on, you know, I have to make sure my right arm is reaching properly over my left arm to reach this. This is kind of transparent to the operator so they can focus on you know, getting to the targets and operating in this case. Um, so this is probably you know, a, a bit of view that you saw from Dr. Drake before that the concept of you know having bimanual tools is really important and very helpful. And this is one of the sample robots that we've done is that you have two tools. One is a pair of graspers that you're able to reach, and one is a pair of scissors. And I would say using normal tools, you would not be able to do this. You would be able to have kind of this straight shot view that you're going to operate, and be, you'll be able to reach that middle rung of the, the pegs. Uh, but now with a bimanual set, you're able to kind of reach up and be able to form cutting. In this case, the left hand is going to reach up and kind of pull this little plastic tube that we have, kind of pull it back down. And then you have kind of this, this the right arm will advance forward. And then it's going to be able to come down and be able to kind of per perform this, you know, cutting. And this could be, you know, representative of tissue that you're pulling down or some sort of area that you want to ablate. And then we took both of these arms. We said, well, let's put them inside the brain or in our silicone brain and see how much we can reach in this case, right? And now, the reach now is much farther in terms of just having a straight corridor coming down. You're able to, you're going to see the tool basically going to bend left, then right, and have a greater amount of motion in this case. So, you know, one of the beautiful things about um, continuous robots is that you're able to build them small, but often one of the challenges is that um, they often still need quite a large workspace in terms of bending motion. And that's one of the things we notice is that for some of these continuous robots that need bending, they often have a high bending radius. So serial manipulators, like industrial robots, have distinct rotation joints, which have the benefit they can, you know, essentially bend right on the spot in this case. And so here I just wanted to show, you know, a scale of the range between, you know, a five millimeter smaller tool that's a Da Vinci tool that has a longer bending radius versus like a pin joint device, which is eight millimeter tool that is larger in diameter, but has a shorter and better radius. So you might say, well, you know, why is this important? But again, you go in the whole concept is that if we're operating in terms of, you know, a large or a small cavity. So in this case, you know, our motivation is doing cleft palate. So cleft palate here is operating inside, you know, uh, the oral cavity of a, a child as a defect. So this requires a surgeon to be hunched over, operating in the, the small space. And then we said, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to, you know, have tools that could be put inside to give the surgeons greater maneuverability. So we did a study just using standard tools, five millimeter, eight millimeter tools. And you know, it's very obvious that eight millimeter tools will obstruct a field of view in this case. So you know, here's, you know, this is a five millimeter tool set. So to give you a sense of context, 
no, this Da Vinci has been trained. And at the very bottom there um, of the figure is actually where the tools are all going inside. Um, and here's a, an, a pair of eight millimeter tools uh, that are going to be inserted. And okay, so they're good. So this video works. So now you kind of show what the space limitation of the figure is. Um, the figure on the right is kind of the external view showing the tools going inside. And the figure on the right hand side is the actual camera view. That's what you're seeing what the surgeons are seeing in this case here. And here we put in eight millimeter tools and the surgeons are trying to dissect the tissue, you know, cut different layers away to expose the fat. But one of the things you're gonna notice is that there is actually not much viewing room or not much tooling. By the time you put two tools down, the space is quite constricted. And you notice sometimes the model actually shifted up and down and that's due to actually external collisions that's happening. So one of the things that we thought was an interesting and basically a counterintuitive discovery was that you know, a lot of the surgeons thought the procedure was actually much easier using the larger tools, um, which was eight millimeters using five, which we thought, well, you know, if you had five millimeter tools, wouldn't it be much easier and simpler to use? But one of the big difference between the eight millimeter and the five millimeter tool was essentially this bending radius. So even though the eight millimeter was larger, it had a much tighter binding radius that it would take up less space. So this essentially kind of motivated us, you know, can we make joints with higher angles, um, but smaller bending radius? And this is where, you know, we tried to investigate uh, using different type of fabrication techniques, instead of using pulleys, uh, essentially using a kind of tool channels to guide this. So this is now an example. Figure A is essentially this cup that represents, you know, our cavity using eight millimeter tool. And then figure C is our latest version going down to about two and a half millimeters that is still a pin joint design that still allows a very tight bending, but allowing the surgeons to not be obstructed by the field of view. So we said that, well, can we push this even more? You know, can we make these joints down to a millimeter in terms of size? And so I mentioned earlier on, this is where we run into fabrication challenges. So, you know, we have these millimeter scale mechanisms that we're trying to build. And we said that, well, instead of actually trying to put a gear or trying to put a, you know, a, you know, a belt to trade a gear train assembly, could we have to create the joint out of the existing material? You know, it would minimize components, you know, make assembly easier. So what we can do is, you know, in groups of, in addition to us, have studied, you know, cutting material away to create notches. And now you're able to apply what they call, you know, one degree of freedom, asymmetric cutting or symmetric cutting. And now you're able to kind of run cables to bend the tools uh, left and right, creating additional degrees of freedom. So we said, well, why don't we take some of this material and let's say, can we cut some of this away? So we hear, you know, this is an example that we cut a little gear joint inside a two millimeter tube, mm -hmm. and now we can have this to bend. So then, you know, one of the challenges of, of building millimeter scale mechanisms is you have a, this trade-off. You have these tubes that are naturally rigid, but now if we want to cut away this material to make it bend, the more material you cut away, you have to make it much more soft. So you want it to be flexible, but you can't have it to be too soft. So one of our PhD students, uh, Kyle, was looking at this concept of contact data compliance in this case. So effectively, what you wanna do is you wanna minimize the amount of cutting, but still provide sufficient material that's there that will kind of provide, when the, when the joint essentially bends, it will still provide mechanical contact and provide uh, reinforcing stiffness to the tool. So the figure on the right-hand side there is a rectangular cut that we've done. You can see a lot of material has been cut away and this allows it to bend. And the, the figure in the middle is a contact aided design. So now we've kind of basically cut away a sliver of material that still allows the tool to bend, but now you have this mechanical interference that when it bends, it will now kind of reinforce it and give it sufficient stiffness to still interact with this material. So this becomes a very interesting you know, um, optimization problem in terms of you have this boundary problem in terms of you know, material cutting versus stiffness, and you have this boundary that you're, this, uh, essentially this variable boundary that you're trying to maximize in this case. Um, so the last thing we want to do is what we said, well, you know, obviously robotic tools are interesting. You know, can we design some of these tools for manual uh, actuation? So this might lead to lower cost and easier, easier acceptance. And we've taken kind of the same, you know, laser cut or edge tools, and we've kind of designed some manual interactions for our manual tools that have the ability to surgeons them to interact and to move. So we've expanded these designs to, you know, a variety of two millimeter tools. So this is uh, two degree freedom asymmetric cut that we've done. And then one of our uh, prior students uh, was able to actually show this. Uh, oops, uh, Sorry, the noise was actually the suction. So 
what you see here is actually uh, uh, the first clinical use of the, the tool. So here, you notice these slits in terms of the metal tubes. This is actually the contact data design. Um, so here, what Arushi has been able to do is she's inserted this tool into the middle ear. So this has gone through the ear canal uh, into the patient. And one of the things there is they're trying to reach up and to kind of bend into that corner. So again, it was inserted straight, but you know, you notice now after the tool has been inserted, it now has kind of a curvature. It's been kind of been bent up. And at the very tip, it carries a little uh, laser that's going to do some ablation um, that it's going to be able to do. So I think we're quite happy that, you know, the ability is, and this was a manual tool. This was not a robotic tool um, that the surgeon can kind of insert. They can tilt up to a certain degree and basically be able to interact or ablate the tissue at this point. And then, you know, obviously I talked about the importance of bimanual. So we've kind of taken these two tools. And so in this case, you know, Peter, one of our former students here, has inserted this into a bell pepper. So this is actually the inside of a red bell pepper. And he's actually taking these tools and actually cutting away different seeds and tissue. And you notice the tools there are not continuous in terms of material. There's all these cuts and exposed. So that's the cutting that he's done. And he's applied these basically uh, filaments inside to be able to do the pulling and retraction of the tools. So the last part, um, or the second last part here was that, well, you know, if cutting material is challenging and you're know, running cables and running tendons is challenging, what if you could remove all that? You know, could you, you know, apply an external force and, you know, actuate these tools? And this is some of the work that we've done with, in collaboration with Professor Baylor um, at MIE from his private robotic lab. And we had this, you know, vision was that, you know, what if we could make tools that were really small or even completely um, independent that you can apply a magnetic field and have these tools re respond to the magnetic field. And so one of our former students, Andrew, designed a series of these magnetic graspers, which you can see is quite thin. You know, these are very small wires. He's attached magnets on them with different designs. And then depending how you orient the magnetic field, whether it's one direction or a second direction, you can get these uh, uh, graspers open, you can get them to close, and you can get them to bend in various uh, different directions. And then this is basically one of his early setups that he's done is that we have this uh, phantom that's put in the middle. We have these electromagnets that are essentially surrounding uh, our model. And then we have a tool that can be pl placed inside. And then uh, I'll play another video. And so the video there is just him, you know, uh, driving one of the tools inside. And then here we're simulating on the right-hand side, the tool operating basically in a fluid environment inside the brain in this case. So we think this is actually a quite an exciting area that could be leveraged more in terms of if we hit this physical limitation in terms of what can be built or what can be uh, fabricated, then maybe external energy that can be applied to help with the actuation and motion in this case. And then I think the last part I want to talk about here was I think one of the things we feel is important is multifunctional tools. So from what you've seen in both in terms of anatomy and even with curved tools, you know, limited workspace entry points make putting in multiple tools quite challenging. Uh, you know, things in neurosurgery and EMT, you know, looking for the airway and sinus, you know, you don't have abilities to really put multiple incisions. So we think this is actually a great opportunity to integrate uh, multiple functions of imaging and tool actuation to solve a couple of uh, clinical problems. So the next few slides are a couple of presentations that our group has um, entered for various um, uh, Hamlin competitions um, in terms of surgical robotics. So I'll let the roll, if you guys, I'll let the robot play, uh, video play. Traditional endoscopic air surgery and can be a complicated procedure, which must all take place within a tight five millimeter channel. In cases where a rigid endoscope is needed for vision, this further restricts the available space inside the channel. These surgeries may further require both suction and irrigation. These tools will also need to be removed and reinserted several times throughout the entire procedure. In addition, current tools are rigid, making it difficult to access certain areas of the middle ear. As a result, these procedures may require the excision of healthy bone and can often be highly invasive. The Sagiti Lab proposes the dexterous endoautoscopic multi-tool that incorporates suction, dissection, grasping, and vision all in one by incorporating recent advancements in miniaturized flexible endoscopes and submillimeter surgical tools. The tool tip employs a rectangular notched nitinol tube to achieve two degrees of freedom roll and pitch. These motions are robotically controlled by a joystick at the back of the device. Housed within the nitinol tube is a PVC tube, which provides both suction and irrigation 
at the press of a button. Vision is provided through a flexible endoscope, which is also routed through the retinal tube. More importantly, a set of 0.78 millimeter forceps allows a surgeon to easily grasp and remove tissue. The forceps are designed to have an additional 8 millimeters of translation, which is actuated by manually pushing in and out using the grasper handles. Traditional endoscopic techniques require the excision of Okay, so then I just want to, so I just want to be cognizant in terms of time. The so clinical issue second, we set right? out to solve is blind stent deployment for the treatment of tracheal and proximal bronchus tumors. In the later stages of lung and airway cancers, some patients are at a risk of complete airway blockage and therefore require surgery to physically deblock the tumor and place a stent to force the airway open. Currently, a rigid bronchoscope in conjunction with a guide wire is used to estimate the correct placement of the stent. However, this method involves some guesswork and often results in a misplaced stent. So Judy has set out to solve this issue by creating a multi-lumen robotic tool for sighted stent deployment. We designed our tool to include everything needed for this procedure, including a steerable tip to gain access to the anatomy in question. The tip is steered by four cables and therefore it has two degrees of freedom, pitch and yaw. Using the steerable tip enables surgeons to access both bronchi and hard to reach places without over torquing the trachea. Once the site of the tumor has been reached, forceps can be passed down through a special channel to collect a biopsy and debulk the tumor to make space for the stent. Should bleeding occur, the tool is equipped with a monopolar cautery pen. The position of the pen is controlled by a slided knob mechanism, then activated by a trigger. Once the tumor has been debulked and the desired position has been reached, the surgeon will deploy the stent at a push of a button while viewing it in real time. The entire multi-lumen trocar is retracted into the handle while pushing out the stent, ensuring proper placement in the airway. The patient is being ventilated through jet insufflation. The tube runs through the trocar and oxygen is pushed out through a small opening in short bursts. We okay, and then I'll, I'll just go quickly through the last one is I mentioned, you know, at the very beginning, one of the things is that we would like to have, you know, some additional safety uh, for the surgeon to guide because as you're operating, you might not be cognizant of other you know, surrounding tissues. So one of the projects that we've been starting on is basically using virtual fixtures to create basically keep away zones for the surgeon to operate. And then you know, we've applied this to basically ultrasonic bone cutting, which we want the surgeon to cut precisely along uh, the skull itself, but not actually penetrate too deeply into the dura itself and causing you know, inadvertent punctures or, or bleeding inside in that case. Um, uh, so with that, I just want to summarize a little bit. Um, you know, minimally invasive neurosurgery and ENT procedures are quite unique from typically seeing laparoscopic or general surgery procedures. You know, one of the challenges we see is that the current tool set provide, prevents surgeons from attempting more complex surgeries. And you know, current surgical robots are fantastic for a lot of their applications, but they're really not well suited for a lot of the applications that we're interested in. And there's often a greater amount of physical and anatomical restriction, but often this provides, you know, a wonderful you know, area of research in terms of you know, looking at how both continuous robotics, laser cut mechanisms, magnetic actuation can potentially provide novel solutions. Um, yeah, so with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, or anything along with. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. You started with uh, a tutorial to us on the surgical procedures and then it went into technology, technical issues, and that made things a lot easier to understand. So, so our students, uh, questions to Thomas. So nobody wants to be operated on by Thomas. As far as you can pose questions. <laughs> Maybe I can start with the first question. I encourage you guys to think uh, uh, what challenges you might experience if you design the tools and uh, technologies. So Thomas, you, you talked about a lot of these miniaturized tools. And uh, when I went to uh, the group I worked in, uh, that was about two and three years ago, ETH Zurich in Brett Nelson's lab. And he has been pushing very hard commercialization so I saw he's a, uh, he's a startup company's instrument with a lot of large coils and, and things. And uh, as usual, it's Swiss made, it's very beautiful. It's not like Canada made, uh, no offense. So, so but uh, I was challenging him that uh, 
uh, I, I often challenge my advisor and he challenges me. I was asking him that with all this infrastructure, the cost, uh, the, the cost extremely high and the benefit you're gaining, is that really worth it? Because in real life, uh, there's gotta be a balance. What do you gain and what do you pay? So, so he, he believes that uh, uh, guiding, navigating a magnetically controlled uh, guide wire is, uh, is worth it uh, by having all the infrastructure and uh, adapting and modifying the existing imaging tools, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think you must experience something similar. I know your tools are typically smaller. You, you are not trying to bring in a significantly additional infrastructure but how do you look at the issue I, I raised? Yeah, and I think that's an excellent point, Son, in terms of, I think, commercialization and distribution. I think I think Dr. Rick has always this belief, and I think we subscribe to the same thought process, is that, you know, tools that, you know, remain in lab, uh, even with us within the hospital, you know, we might get them to early clinical use within our own, own acceptance, but unless you can find a way to distribute or, you know, partner with a company to distribute it, I think that's going to be quite limiting in terms of its impact. Um, I think this is where I guess um, there's a, a disconnect in terms of, I call it, you know, medical device economics versus patient need in this case, right? Because especially, if, you know, from our space, if you look at pediatrics itself, it's, you know, we represent probably about 10% of the whole patient market in this case. So a lot of tools or a lot of things that are, are used or developed by companies cater to the larger adult market. And you could probably, you know, understand where they're coming from. So from an economic point of view, in terms of both the regulatory design, regulatory approval, certification, these added costs, like you said, makes the cost benefit argument quite challenging in this case, right? So I think that's one of the things is that when we've been trying to look at um, developing tools or developing new devices, is we try to not interrupt the workflow as much as possible in this case, right? Uh, we try to kind of not necessarily reuse, but we try to adapt the tools to the workflow so that it's easier to use and easier to accept. And I think that's one of the reasons we had also gone down the path of, well, you know, these robotic tools. So, so me being an engineer, I love the design, you know, very sophisticated, fancy robots that can be autonomous, you know, they drive on their own and stuff like that. But I think one of the challenges, like you said, developing a device like this, healthcare budgets around the world are still quite fixed and limited in this case. So we said, well, is there an intermediate step? So before you maybe get to a full robotic system is could you have a manual tool or something in this case? And at least that way we find with manual tools, there's a little bit easier pathway in terms of both regulatory cost and acceptance that might give you a stepping stone so that people will accept that first part before moving on potentially more sophisticated. Um, I think there's also another piece of advice that I've gotten from one of the surgeons and you know, working in the hospital. You know, surgeons and clinicians themselves are fairly skilled people in terms of, you know, they can make do with as much as, you know, like very basic stuff. So, you know, the tools that you're trying to provide to them, you have to make sure you have to give them a significant almost order of magnitude or, you know, like four or five time improvement in this case. So I think this whole clinical benefit is, is factored in their mind in that case, because sure, yeah, they can spend all this time learning, buying new tools, but if it's not gonna improve very much too, I think from a clinical perspective, it won't be accepted at the same time. And I think that's often, you know, one of the targets um, that we often pick then, you know, we often will pick procedures that are not doable or, you know, what we like to say, we try to make the inoperable operable in this case, right? These are conditions that are cannot be done using current tools and they would have significant benefit to both the patient and to basically the healthcare system if it was possible at the same time. Beautiful answer. I, I think our students in this audience, uh, all of them are very young. So I'm old enough. I think uh, what, what you talked about uh, resonates strongly. Uh, is very consistent with what I read, what I understood from working with surgeons and clinicians. And so incremental uh, improvement a lot of times. So these surgeons are very, uh, very hard to deal with. They're extremely skillful, by the way. If you think your tool is very cool and you go to them and, and they can do a lot better without your tool. And, and also I think Thomas said a wonderful thing in that I also realized if you guys uh, or any student developed a tool or technology, imaging, whatever things, and you show to uh, clinicians, physicians, and if all you get is interesting, you know, to me, it's an insult. 
<laughs> I experienced enough. First time I heard uh, interesting, I was very excited. I, I said, yeah, they're interested. No, that's not, well, that's not what it means. They're being polite. And later on, when I develop something, I wouldn't be specific. The, the physician's eyeballs are shining, they're sparkling, and they really want to do clinical trial second day. That tells me this thing might be useful. So, so uh, my advice to you is, if someone tells you interesting, that person is a professor, that's okay, because we see everything interesting. If a clinician tells you interesting and they stop there, you might want to give it a second thought. <laughs> so I hope uh, Thomas agrees with what I said. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a that's a good piece of advice because you know you know medical advice companies are quite good at you know de developing you know various incremental changes, cosmetic changes. So you know as clinicians, you know they probably see a lot of devices uh, that you know they may or may not have any benefit. You know they look differently, but like you said, they're interesting. But at the end of the day, does it help? May or may not. I think the positive response is that I think if you show your product or design, and they say, "Oh, can I use this tomorrow?" I think I think I think you got something. <laughs> so questions from our students. It's a, it's a it's a uh, it's a fabulous topic uh, to talk about. You guys can also ask about um, regulatory issues and materials and and uh, uh, commercialization hurdles. You ask anything because Thomas uh, has worked at MDA. You guys all know MDA. Uh, it sounds like irrelevant to medical robotics, but there is relevance. I visited MDA a few times. They, they, they do contract work beautifully. So in my mind, it doesn't matter if it's a medical robot, it's a space robot. As long as you pay MDA, you'll get it done. <laughs> That's the kind of impression I got. So, so anything you guys want to ask Thomas, I would encourage you to do so. Yeah, I have a question. Um, it's actually related a bit to what Prof just said. Um, um, what what uh, experiences from doing space robotics were you able to bring to the surgical robotics field? And, and I'm also curious, um, what, what made you switch from space to uh, surgical? Yeah, so, so, so I probably won't bore you the whole story in that case because um, I, I, my, my former master supervisor, uh, Professor Vermeer, who's actually a director of UTI, so he actually, we were trying to uh, deciding if I should stay for a PhD. And actually at that time I was doing do, to do attitude control for satellite manipulation, which is quite different. <laughs> um, but you know, the whole takeaway, I think the whole concept of, you know, uh, so for me, I'm actually at heart, I'm a, basically I'm a controls guy in that case, right? So I'm a controls and kinematics person. So that's an area that I was interested in. So. Even the work that I was doing at MDI, as you're much interested in modeling, doing you know uh, control and uh, different types of mechanisms in that case, so I think that kind of fundamental knowledge is easily translatable to you know different sectors. So whether it's like, and Sun you know put it quite nicely, you know whether it's building a robot that's going to sit on the shuttle and going to do move the joints in this case, it's, it's just a different context, environment. Since then you're building now small devices, you still have to apply you know your same design knowledge in terms of like modeling control theory to see if that works, but obviously your, your scale and shape is quite different. Uh, from a more pragmatic standpoint, in terms of, you know, you know working in an industrial environment, it required a lot of basic both regulatory hurdles required for devices approved in the in the, uh, the aerospace industry. There's, you know, they often joke, you know, you design a joint, you might have like a 200 page, you know, technical manual <laughs> describing all the fail safes and all this, because, you know, designing those type of mechanisms, you know, you know, I don't want to use the cliche, failure is not an option. You have triple redundancy in terms of joints, cabling. You look at the failure analysis. So you look at the same thing. You know, if this robot's going to be operating inside a patient, you don't want this to fail. I think that's one of the big things. Whether it's a mechanical device or electromechanical, you have to find a way. If the power cuts out, well, how do you pull the robot out? You know, if your cable snaps, what do you do? So these are elements from the regulatory perspective. You know, obviously there's a different side of regulations in terms of medical device approval versus you know aerospace approval. I think those you have to keep cognizant about at the same time in that case. Yeah. Another um, wonderful answer. I really like your answer, Thomas. So, so if I look at the uh, space, I never worked in space industry. All I know is healthcare industry. But indeed, uh, both industries are highly regulated. Uh, and uh, for our students, we can imagine that uh, something working in the space, uh, you have to consider the materials, to fit in the environment, 
Hermetico is similar. You can't use any materials in our bodies. And uh, you can think of the reliability issues. But uh, what ties all of us together in this class and also Robotics Institute is really how, how do we define uh, the commonality, the common ground of all these professors working uh, on autonomous driving, uh, aerial vehicles, and healthcare um, uh, robotics. And really, all of us uh, work with or use control theory. We do computer vision. We do mechanism design. All these technical pillars tie us together. But uh, we all go into different, uh, I call it application themes or pillars. And some of our faculty members don't like it because it sounds less fundamental. But I, I'm, I think I'm beyond the wording uh, about fundamental applied to me. Uh, anything that has value in it is worth doing. Uh, if you want to label yourself fundamental, you think you'll look better, that's okay. But that's your personal preference. I, I would say in healthcare robotics, see Thomas, whether he agrees. I think healthcare, uh, especially surgical robotics, I think is largely applied. I, I rarely see that uh, something, uh, a fundamental technology coming out of a uh, medical surgical robot, and that uh, goes everywhere to permeate the whole robotics field or the whole uh, te technical domain. I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I wouldn't call this a consumer or application area. Uh, I think a lot of uh, physicians taught me that uh, when you teach students, they advised me, when you teach students, you, you tell them that uh, working in surgical or healthcare robotics one major uh, piece of education component is uh, domain knowledge. You need to become a very uh, experienced, highly knowledgeable domain knowledge, uh, knowledge uh, user. You understand that. And then you can exercise robotics techniques to devise something really benefit patients. So I think that's really good advice. In the meanwhile, uh, on the other hand, uh, academics might be very extreme telling us, you know what, uh, anything that uh, that's not novel, I will not do. And the acad academic novelty sometimes can be annoying in that uh, it's a very flashy demonstration and then you know it doesn't go anywhere. I think we all need to uh, get a balance in between. I think a demonstration alone indeed sometimes uh, get us away from uh, real application in healthcare. So I said a lot of things again and Thomas probably has more to, uh, more first-handed to share. Yeah, I think those are, I think, excellent points. I think, um, and it may actually end up, you know, we fall in the same boat because, you know, for us, a lot of our problems are, are, are kind of brought to us by the clinicians or by the staff because, you know, they're trying to address this. So often in some cases, um, you know, I would call them the easy problems might be the case of just ident us identifying, you know, work that's been done by, you know, more fundamental roboticists you know, or fundamental designers and applying this. Uh, but I think it can also come the other way in a sense that, you know, let's say you go out, you start the path from the application side. Now you kind of identify the potential research or solutions that have been done. Um, but then they will often they may actually reach a limitation itself. So you may end up swimming back the other way because you might say, well, and I'll give an interesting example. The last one that we worked on was, you know, virtual fixtures applied to a bone cutting in this case, right? So again, you know, virtual fixtures are a quite you know, fundamental area of research you know, in terms of people have done quite a bit of that. Uh, we applied it through, you know, our bone cutting, but when we thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to be able to kind of, you know, generate these virtual fixtures more dynamically or in a more fast paced structure in this case, right? So that kind of led to then a more uh, fundamental discussion in terms of like, how do you create, you know, these both concave, what they call concave or convex virtual structures. And that leads to basically a whole area, you know, a whole project in itself, looking at a very fundamental area that's not necessarily applied to both uh, healthcare robotics, but can, can lead to uh, other applications too, in that case. Um, and, 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 and same thing, I think Sunny put it quite nicely in terms of, I think what binds us, a lot of us at the Robotics Institute is, you know, that core interest in terms of the fundamental knowledge in terms of mechanism design and theory. And, you know, if you ever run into me at any of the uh, ICRA IROS conferences, I'm often quite interested actually in a lot of the marine applications. So even though we don't do any, you know, you think of, you know, me working in the hospital, why are you interested in robots that go underwater in this case, right? But I find a lot of these topics quite interesting because it, you might see topics that they might apply in terms of maybe surface mapping, computer vision, or sometimes, you know, some sort of navigation. We say, well, these are quite cool. Like, why don't we take this back and see if these algorithms can be tweaked or adjusted 
to work inside the brain or to work inside the heart in that case, right? So it's a, it's definitely, a, like I said, there's a core element, a common theme that kind of connects us, but I think there are you know, domain areas that people are interested in. Great, uh, great points. Uh, any other questions? I, I think uh, Thomas and I have been talking. <laughs> and uh, Kaden, go ahead. Yeah, um, I was I was curious about that middle ear um, surgery that you did. I was wondering how you took um, basically, you know, this this prototype or this technology you're developing and end up using it in this trial. Um, or like, yeah. what's the process look like? Yeah, so in terms of this translation pathway, and this is one that we still have not fully cracked the nut in that case. So devices that are designed and fabricated within the hospital, um, they go through, obviously, you know, there's a, a safety review process and an approval process. Uh, but when they're actually used for the patient, when we go to Health Canada and ask them, these are considered internal research devices. So Health Canada uh, doesn't require laborious external paperwork for them to approve because they view this is an internal device. So obviously there are sufficient checks and balances within the hospital for us. We have to go through uh, several safety reviews, do adverse event monitoring, uh, but that in itself is at least within the institution. And you, you know, as let's say a, a researcher within the institution have fairly good knowledge or at least basically contacts within the institution to help you facilitate this translation. So in that case, you know, within about a year and a half, we're able to kind of, you know, design this tool, create it, test it on the bench, and create a clean version, get it through ethics approval. And then, you know, as long as the patient is, then basically the next step is you go through patient recruitment. But as long as the patient is made aware, and then you've addressed the safety concerns, we can go and collect that data and use it on patient in that case. So I think for us, the challenge that we have not been able to fully crack is that, you know, often, you know, not just us, but UHN, um, all the other academic hospitals train a lot of fellows and residents that graduate, you know, and then go on to, you know, successful careers in their own practice. But what's interesting is, you know, they find and they see a lot of our tools that we build. And the first question is when they finish their fellowship is they, they'll ask us, can we take these with us? You know, you know, let's say if they go back down to California or they go down to Boston or to Florida, they'll say, well, I want to use this in my practice. How do I get access to this, right? But I think this is where the hurdle that has not been overcome yet. And this is a, a, a very apparent challenge we're facing right now is that we're trying to find a way to supply these tools, but you as an institution are not allowed to distribute what they call distribute or give a tool, even if it's for free. Like if I, if I don't charge you, I just give you the tool, then it requires a leap of regulatory action in that case, because then, you know, the tool has to be made safe, has to be certified. And in effect, that creates a bit of a barrier in terms of the, how do we kind of like distribute this innovation or these tools to other states. So this is one that, We've been actively working on with other sites to, to see if they can find a way to create some sort of vehicle or some sort of mechanism to allow you know clinicians to access these tools more readily. And for us, this is quite apparent in the pediatric space because you know an easy answer you might say, well, you know, why don't you just partner with a company, get them to make it? But again, with a lot of these pediatric tools, let's say if there's only 50 pediatric centers around the world that use this, you might order 50, maybe 100 of these tools, right? But the the bur but the cost and the burden to create these tools might make it more uh, expensive or not cost effective in terms of turning down uh, what a person or an institution might pay. So uh, you know a simple tool like a shunt tool or or, or a grasper, material wise, even if it's made out of stainless medical grade stainless steel, might only be fifty dollars to make. In that case, you know from a cost perspective, but from a approval and regulatory perspective, that $50 tool could easily become, let's say, an $800 tool. And now it becomes a different question. Because if you say, if you come to a hospital and say, well, would you buy this $50 tool? They probably won't blink an eye. They'll say, sure, you know, give us five of these <laughs> in this case, right? You know, they're medical grade, we can sterilize them. But now if you take the same tool, well, you know, you, you say, well, would you like to buy this tool for $1,000? That changes the argument. And I think that's where, I think Sun points out, you know, this whole cost benefit conundrum. Comes in the case, that's why. So, to Thomas, I'll continue with Caden's question. Uh, I know Healthcare uh, Health Canada uh, scrutinizes less for a tool uh, you use for internal, meaning inside a uh, sickest hospital. Mm -hmm. That's why the approval was faster for internal use. Right. So, wouldn't it work if you 
uh, share the technology totally to a Californian company and they go through FDA to claim for only internal use in their own hospital. So, so why wouldn't that model work? Yeah, so that's something actually that we're trying to investigate is the whole concept is, you know, instead of like a, like a dedicated license or something is that, you know, what if you we made a lot of these tools in a sense, open source in that case, right? Um, or, you know, create a, a thing of verse for medical devices in a sense that, because, you know, for us, you know, being researchers you know, from the hospital and, you know, engineers, a lot of our you know staff are really interested in, in seeing these tools get to the patient and making that impact in that case, right? Um, so that's an excellent point. So that's actually that's something that we're trying to figure out if if there's a way that we can do that. If there's a way we can either you know open source them or make them basically uh, uh, free of use in that case, so they can go and fabricate and take those designs forward in that case. An alternative approach um, is certainly uh, to be licensed to a large medical device company. And uh, in your case, you have uh, clear advantages uh, in the tool. So what, why don't you see a large medical device company jump on it? And, and uh, they have more experience and resources uh, going through regulatory approval and distribution. Is it because uh, the pediat pediatric market is too small or um, for other reasons? Yeah, I think for us in some of these specific cases, these are more pointed to our pediatric tools. So it's almost like a very subset or niche population that we've been targeting. So I think the clinical benefit is quite clear. You know, I think clinicians and stuff are happy to use it and try it. But I think it gets to that whole ballpark in the sense that, you know, in a large medical device company, whether it's a Met, uh, Medtronic or a J&J, &J, uh, you, know, you know, the first question they'll ask is, you know, does this have clinical benefit? How do the clinicians like it? And, you know, that's kind of like the first check mark in that case. And then, you know, the second check mark or second question they will ask, well, they say, well, how many of these are you doing <laughs> in this case, right? And if that scale is not on order, I would say easily like thousands in that case, then it becomes a bit of a non-starter. Because I think for them, they have this internal calculator that does a internal rate of return for them. That's saying that, you know, based on this volume, I cannot get a internal rate of return of you know on this to satisfy my you know corporate board or investors, um, and I think that becomes part of the economic challenge. So you know if I put on my 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 MBA hat and look at this, um, you know do you have these internal drivers that are rate of returns that companies need to match or to meet expectations, and it ends up being in a sense that it ends up being quite simplistic. It's a it's a number <laughs> in that case, right? So if they're not able to kind of make that number, it makes a very tough argument in that case. I, I just have a follow-up question, um, I guess, on the like uh, economic side. Um, mm -hmm. So, like you said, you, if you could, you would, you know, you want to share, make this technology open source. I was wondering how that uh, impacts your project, because I think a lot of engineers would like to build things and <laughs> just share the technology without worrying about making money. I was wondering how that works for you. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's part of the challenge. So, I, I guess you know, for us we're in a bit of a half, I call it a, like a hybrid situation says that, you know, obviously if you're, if you're in academia, one of the goals is you should be publishing novel research, uh, getting work out there. And then, you know, in industry, the goal might not be publishing, but it might be for, you know, generating patents, you know, to protect the investment um, of the company itself. Um, I think one of the things is that I think ultimately you, you as an engineer developing, you have to ask yourself, what do you want to do with that tool in that case, right? Um, if that tool is to, 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 to be translated and put more toward clinical use, um, there are some factors that you might have to say, well, you know, I've developed this tool, it may be used for clinical use, so I'm happy to open up the design um, to apply that. And so again, this is more brainstorming that we're doing on our side. So it could be the case that even though a tool might be shared, there still might be revenue to be made. So I give a good example uh, of like Red Hat in this case, right? Red Hat is a software company that, that you know, distributes Linux in this case, right? But Linux, you know, you can go anywhere and start downloading Linux. You don't have to buy Red Hat Linux. But Red Hat has been a very successful company because they've been able to basically develop basically modules or training platforms or customizations that they charge as a service on top of the open source platform, right? So maybe the open source material is so complicated or not intuitive to use, it requires something that an additional value added service that has to be put on top. So another example is like Arduino. 
in this case, right? So I'm sure many of you guys have used Arduino microcontrollers. Arduino itself is open source, right? You know, you can download Arduino schematics and you know, you often on Amazon and stuff, you can get Arduino knockoffs for probably a fraction of the cost <laughs> in this case, right? You know, an Arduino branded controller is probably, I think I bought one a couple of weeks ago, might be $50 for Arduino you know, Uno or something. You can get the same one for probably $8, you know, in components. But Arduino as a company has, is alive and well, and they're doing, and again, I think they provide this value added service in terms of either software development modules and stuff. So I think this might require maybe a different angle of looking at how to generate revenue in this case, right? So I know historically it's been said that, you know, patents, you use patents and, and things to protect and they do, you know, to protect your investment, but there actually might be other more interesting ways to look at this too, in that case. And, you know, if you look at the tech industry, these are avenues that have been shown in that case. So, so Thomas, we all know uh, the DaVinci robot very well. At least uh, I tried it a few times at conferences, like playing a game. And so, so my question to you is, uh, is it true that uh, DaVinci robot used uh, less in uh, pediatric, pediatric surgery, including neurosurgery, compared to other uh, surgical procedures in adults? Yeah, and then actually that, that is often quite a point of debate too, because like for us in a lot of pediatric cases, due to the size and the shape of the DaVinci, it's probably not as well used in that case. Um, a lot of uh, adults, so many, especially in the US, many adult hospitals will have it, but even children hospitals will have it. But I think that's one thing that we want to be cognizant in terms of before, let's say, so again, this goes into the cost benefit analysis is that, you know, before an institution invest, you know, not just, and especially for a DaVinci, it's an ongoing cost. There's upfront large capital cost of a couple million dollars plus ongoing usage costs of the tools. You have to make sure that there is sufficient operating volume to cover these cases. So I know in our case, you know, some of our urologists who've been very interested in using the DaVinci have kind of like partnered with our UHN adult counterpart. So they'll go over and do some of these adult cases over at UHN um, while kind of investigating and building the case to see if there's sufficient case volume um, to invest in a full scale, scale dimension in that case. Um, so I think that's one of the cases I think, you know, it's a good example that, you know, for certain areas of the healthcare area, certain robotics may not solve everything in this case, uh, but that doesn't mean other robotic systems are not uh, possibly use, useful in this case. So, um, you know, for other, or specific domain areas, like for spine and for, uh, for neurosurgery, there are actually companies that are developing what I call procedure physic, uh, systems that more and more people are using in this case too. Cool questions? Isn't it fabulous to hear all this and you guys have no questions? Well, it's too early in the morning. <laughs> So, so, so it's, it's funny that one time, uh, I think another friend of mine, a physician, told me working at Sickest Hospital, saying that your patients, uh, is it up to the age of 18 that you can go to Sickest? I think it's 18. And I think there, there is, I think there's probably a greater, I think officially, I think it's 18, but there might be some, depending on the handover here, it might be between 18 to 19. Oh. At a hospital. So that, that's what they told me. Some of your patients are bigger than the physicians and some of them are tiny, just newborn. Uh, so so uh, for the uh, big guys, the 18 year old, the very tall uh, uh, that uh, patient, is it still counted as pediatric sur surgery procedure? Yeah, I guess from uh, the way the hospital is organized, I guess they're still considered pediatric patients in that case, but obviously then in terms of their both their anatomical scale and volume, then a lot of more adult tools can be applicable in that case. So then they're almost from a clinical perspective, they're probably then. Uh, so again, this is all my own view. It's probably treated more from like adult usage in terms of tools in that case. So then you have more uh, options or more uh, variety to choose from in that case, which is, but obviously that's obviously quite different going to operating on a newborn that has very different, you know, anatomical constraints their development patterns, the growth patterns, the tissue behavior is different at that point, so. Right, right, uh, questions? I thought next time I develop a, a, a dumber tool, it's large, I would just say it's pediatric tool, operating on, on a big patient, <laughs> not on fetus. <laughs> so anybody else, uh, it, it's uh, 10.30, maybe two more questions to Thomas.
I will not, I will not ask anymore. So any more questions from you guys? Hi, Thomas. Um, so obviously, you know, we work together uh, on, on these smiles, small scale robotics. Um, what do you think uh, about the, the manufacturing side of these robots? Are you satisfied with, with the, um, the techniques or the technologies that are available at SickKids for, for manufacturing these things? Or do you, do you find you have to outsource a lot? Like, is there maybe one specific machine or technique that you wish you had? Or what, what do you think about that aspect? Yeah, so, and that's an excellent point, Cameron, in terms of fabrication. So one of the reasons we've gone down the path of machine robots is that they're, they're easy to make in that, in that case, right? You know, so if you look at them, these are tubes, these are cuts, uh, they can be shape set. So the fabrication process is quite useful, but then, you know, obviously the, the, the mathematical formulation for the kinematics and the controls and stuff is much more challenging in this case. And, and even at some scale, you know, going down to one millimeter, you do get limitations of what can be done with them. So you might have to go back to more traditional, you know, gears and stuff. But I think that's where we hit a bit of a bottleneck in terms of like getting these uh, fabrication techniques that can be used. So obviously you know, at the hospital here, we're fortunate to have, you know, laser welders, laser cutters that are used for stents that we modify, small CNCs that are, that, you know, that, so for people who have done machining, you know, we have end mills on the order of five thou or six thou in this case, right? So they're quite small. They're almost like a fraction of a hair, if you imagine in this case. Um, but I think that, that that's, I would say that's part of the limitation to us, you know, building more sophisticated um, drive mechanisms in that case. Uh, I know there's been some really wonderful manufacturing concepts in terms of, um, you know, uh, there are companies that are able to kind of etch you know, various uh, gears or mechanisms on wafers of silicone, which are quite wonderful. They make very wonderful structures. And I think even I've seen some of the, the work that Sun has done before in this case, um, but we need them just to be a little bit bigger <laughs> in this case, that's fine. Um, and also cost a little bit less. I think, you know, when you're ordering from some of these companies, you're essentially ordering a whole wafer of silicone that you're filling. So um, they're nice to have, but I think they're also quite expensive to, to do at the same time. So from a cost perspective, I think that's something that's probably not as feasible for a mass production in that case. So I think uh, for for those you know for people out there who you know are interested in, in fabrication challenges or manufacturing challenges, you know, I think building I think the use term I guess measles scale is half millimeter to one millimeter or one and a half millimeter parts. I think if you have a way to make those types of mechanisms. Um, I think you would have a market because, you know, I often joke that when we're looking for ways to build this, we, we're in a bit of a, I call it like a, not a, like a bit of a death valley in the sense that you can get traditional manufacturing going down to about two millimeters in terms of scale. And then you can go to like very nano scale, like people are doing really interesting, fascinating stuff, building you know, molecule by molecule, but we can't get it something in between. And I think that's where a lot of our dices fall into that's not quite present. So we push really hard on the large scale all the way down that we get to some point and we try to push up the other way, but they don't quite make it. So I think that's where something is missing. And we, we don't have quite the, the answer for it. Uh, you know, we, we try with both our fabrications in-house and with companies, but I think this goes back to a bit of the fundamental research challenge. I think this kind of drives this other concept where you, you have this gap that now we can kind of go back and say, well, can you look at interesting ways to do like, you know, you know electroplating or electro material deposition uh, to create strong enough structures, right? And these are very fundamental um, type of questions that are trying to be addressed. So. Well, last question, if there is one. Hi, Dr. Uh, I can ask you a last question if you don't mind. So, you said the doctors are really willing to try out the new tools, but just curious about the patient point of view, like how well mm -hmm. do they accept the new tools? Or do we have any concerns in general? Yeah, so I think that's an excellent point in terms of consent in this case, right? It has to be both uh, the clinician acceptance and uh, the patient acceptance. Um, I think, you know, so I'm gonna give you a bit of a vague answer because it'll really vary based on the tool in this case, right? If it's a very kind of like superficial tool that's operating, you know, not in very invasively uh, and very simplistic, but it has makes an impact, then I feel that a lot of patients would be okay in that case because you know they get explained, you know, when you're consenting this, the complexities, 
or the issues or the, or the challenges related to it. Uh, but obviously, if it's a much more complicated tool, the onus is on the develop developer to make sure that there's you know clear mitigation for risks and for safety, um, and to con and to basically show the patient why it's important to be done this way in that case. So we you know we have had clinical trials that we've been trying to recruit patients for many for a very long time because a the patient uh, scope doesn't fit what we want and it becomes very challenging to recruit in that case. Um, but then the other cases, sometimes the tools are more easy or more superficial, then it's easier to use in that case, right? So it, re it really is dependent on kind of, I would call it the, the risk profile and the benefit profile of the tool in that case. Um, I think for us being an academic hospital is helpful too, because people then, you know, are, you know, they go to, you know, not just sick kids, but to UHN, Midwestern, and they're known for, you know, not uh, known for creative and innovative therapies that will improve the patient care. In that case. Thank you, Thomas. I, I think uh, we, we take enough of her time.